Hello everybody, welcome to EPG Patshala. Continuing the lessons in culture studies, today we will be looking at power culture. This is Pramod Nair of the Department of English, the University of Hyderabad. At first sight, it might seem odd that we have linked power and culture in one category or under one rubric. What is the purpose behind it? How does it provide any kind of advantage or critical method? One tends to think of culture as some neutral space of practices, whether they are films or television or advertising or media, and power as something that we understand in terms of politics, finance, the market economy and things like that. So we don't normally associate culture as possessing power or power has a culture of its own, except in terms of, say, political parties, which have a certain cultural uh, system in place, whether it's their propaganda and uh, the triumphal arches and m massive meetings. So why do we think of culture in terms of power at all? The answer is fairly simple if you think about it. When we look at an advertisement for a particular product, why do we think we should buy that product? We think we should buy that product because something in that advertisement recommends that product, persuades us. When we say the language of the advertisement persuades us, we are saying the language of the advertisement has a certain set of concepts, a certain a set of values, which employ certain techniques that persuade us. This means the language of the advertisement has some kind of power over us. That's point one. Point two, suppose we think in terms of the environment. Now, our cultural practices, whatever they might be, whether it is of farming or whether it is of tourism or recreational sports, we tend to think of the environment as a place where we can go and do all these things. And we say uh, that's meant for humanity to work, play, whatever. Now, where does this assumption, where does this notion come from that the environment is available for us to work, play in? It is because over the centuries, the humans have come to believe this as a way of thinking. You will remember in earlier lessons we spoke about hegemony and ideology, where we argued and we demonstrated that we come to believe in certain things because over a period of time this becomes part of the way we think. It's not an extra lesson. It's not something you need to be told. It becomes part of our cultural unconscious. Now. When we say that the environment is there for me to play and I can go and do sports here and recreation there, what am I saying? I am saying I have a certain attitude towards nature. I have a certain value towards nature and about nature. This is ideology. But I say all this because I am human. I have technology. I have money. And nature, but the tree, the animal doesn't. This represents the power of humanity over that species over that landscape, but it is not visible, embodied as power. It is embodied as cultural practice. That is, our sports, our hunting, our fishing, our recreational hobbies are cultural practices that conceal, and the important word is conceal, they conceal within them the ideology that nature exists to serve the humans. It is this ideology that nature exists to serve the humans that we can call power relations. Power relations between humanity and nature. But this power relation, like I said, is not visible. It's not embodied. We can only think of them in terms of cultural practices. Let me give you a third example. When we want to study something in classrooms, in literature or cultural studies classrooms, we normally do not think in terms of using pulp fiction. Absolutely bad, pulpy, third rate. We cannot use that. I'm using descriptors which we say we employ when we talk about it. No, that's pulp. That's very bad. That's trash. What are we doing here? We are saying in literature classrooms, we can read only Shakespeare and Wordsworth. But uh, Agatha Christie, maybe not. Or maybe as an occasional text, we can. But 50 shades of grey, no. Uh, why? Oh, because it's trash. Now, when you use the word trash within quotes, you have given a value judgment about a cultural product. This cultural product is part of a system of relations where 
the teacher in the class has power over a set of texts. Bad texts, good texts. Texts that can be studied, texts that cannot be studied. Texts that are good for you, texts that are bad for you. What we are talking about is again ideology where the teacher in a position of authority, in a position of power, determines the cultural values of a book, a film, a novel, a TV series. In other words, culture is linked to power because culture persuades us in advertisement, like I said. It establishes relations between, say, nature and environment in the second example I gave. And in the third, it reinstates and reinforces the value of a particular class of people. So if, for instance, the teacher says, you cannot read this kind of rubbish. Suppose the teacher makes a statement like that. What is the teacher doing? The teacher is saying, I am the teacher. I say this is not a good book. You cannot read it. The class position of the teacher as a figure of knowledge, as the embodiment of learning, is reinforced when he or she puts together this injunction, this rule. This is bad, this is good. Attached to this is something else. Unless the teacher imposes this kind of practice and this kind of norm over cultural practices, he or she cannot show power, which is why culture and power go together. In cultural studies, we are interested in ways, methods and strategies through which certain cultural forms are rejected, devalued, erased, and others are raised up as wonderful reading. Now, the interesting thing about this is this changes over time. When power relations change, the requirements of cultural practices also change. To go back to my third example, why should we read Shakespeare and why we should not read uh, Fifty Shades of Grey? Why should we read Shakespeare? Oh, because Shakespeare is a great playwright. Okay. Then the teacher says, um, he has been read universally. Okay. Third, he has been read for a very long time. Now, if you think this is what the teacher has said, pay some attention to the problematic nature of power relations. Shakespeare wrote for the popular. He was a mass entertaining artist. People paid money, stood in the rain in winter to watch his plays. If you were to convert Shakespeare into our present language and try and see how he wrote, he was the masala writer of his time. Now he is a classical, great, highly literary scholar. He is a very scholarly writer. But actually, when he was writing, he was writing for the masses. You see, Shakespeare wanted only one thing. Large number of people should come and watch my plays. That's how I make my money. He did not write for people to write their PhD dissertations. He did not write for people to be teaching him in class. He wrote to entertain the masses. So if you pay attention to Shakespeare, there is more thrill in Shakespeare than in 20th century thriller fiction. He has violence, he has sex, he has killings, murder, mutilation, incest, infidelity, extramarital affairs, killing of fathers and children, you name it, he has got it. If you pay some attention to the popular nature of Shakespeare's work, you will understand he was catering to the cultural requirements of the 16th century. We now think of him as a sophisticated scholarly figure. And the English teacher is not going to introduce Shakespeare in class saying, let us now look at the biggest masala writer of all time. No. How do the teachers do this? The teachers say, let us introduce you to the great Shakespeare. The tag masala or popular writer has suddenly become great scholarly, universal, classical writer. This is a demonstration of the power of the academia, of the system of staging plays, of the system of film production over the minds of children, over the minds of the viewers. Why is this important? Why should we pay attention to this? We need to pay attention to this because of a very simple reason. And this should recall for some of you what we have already argued about at ideology and hegemony. To go back to the example I gave about nature, suppose somebody says, um, but you know it's wrong to hunt those animals and destroy those trees because you want to do your sports and your recreational hobbies. And I'm offended and I say, but nature is there for me to exploit. 
you will say, uh, but no, you cannot do this because they have rights. And my question to you would be, who gave them rights? What rights do animals have? You see, I am implicitly suggesting, implicitly suggesting that our cultural practices have always given more rights to the human than to the animal, than to nature. Likewise, if you recall the system of slavery right through to the early decades of the 19th century when trade in slaves was banned and slavery begins to collapse in the United States. When people argued that the blacks, black people imported from Africa um, should be treated like humans, the white said, what do you mean they should be treated like humans? They're not human. They're black. What is that saying? What they're saying is our definition of the human does not include them. So in our culture, we don't have to account for the rights of the blacks. Also because slaves cannot be given their own culture. In other words, what we are looking at here is a system of social relations which codes power relations. And the denial of identity, rights, any cultural privilege is not about the cultural practice, it's about power. So when the blacks wanted rights, they said, what do you mean blacks need rights? They are only good for hard physical labor. They don't have brains. They will not be becoming chess masters, writing Shakespeare's plays, playing the piano. They are only good for physical labor. This stereotype is cultural, yes. However, this cultural stereotyping is a result of power relations. It's not natural to the cultural species. It is because the whites needed slaves that they emphasized that blacks only have physical prowess, not mental prowess. They are good at labor, they are not good at intellectual activity. For cultural studies, it's important to analyze concepts and values as embedded in such systems of power relations. This could be gender, this could be class, this could be race. Our interest in questions of cultural practices pays attention to how these practices naturalize power relations. What do I mean by naturalize? Remember what I gave you as an example. When the debate comes up about environment, and some of you, if you have been reading the newspapers in the last five years, will remember that in the United Kingdom, there was this huge debate against fox hunting. Fox hunting has been a traditional English sport played by kings and queens. And the environmentalists and the animal rights activists said, this is a very cruel thing. You should not um, indulge in this bloody sport. The queen did not participate. For the last five, six years, she has not participated. But do you know what the consequence was? Several of the older hunting clubs protested. They said, it is our right to hunt the fox. We have done it for centuries. What makes us English, that is English culture, ensures that hunting is a part of it. Now think of what is going on here. The English establishment in the terms of class and royalty and things like that can demonstrate class privilege only by saying we have power over the animal. I have rights over the animal. That's what they were saying. So the protest said, why are you taking away our rights from us? We are royalty. We belong to the ruling class. And how does the ruling class demonstrate we are ruling class? By going on the hunt. And now you are saying you can't do this. That's unfair. Now think about what is going on here. The ideology of class distinction can only be enforced through cultural practice. Please understand what I am trying to say. You see power does not operate in very visible ways. Power operates through cultural mechanisms. The cultural apparatus of the hunt, which is being utilized, is being utilized for the purpose of saying, I am in power. Who hunts? The upper classes hunt. Oh, these people are hunting. They must be of the upper classes. You see, that's the way the argument goes. Because ordinary people don't hunt. They kill animals because they want to eat them, because they are hungry. But they don't necessarily kill because there is killing as sport available to them. Upper classes think of killing as sport. So you see the mark of upper class as opposed to the mark of the working class is the hunt. So should we ban the hunt? Should we say 
you no longer have rights to kill, injure, mutilate the animal because the cultural rights of the upper classes are paramount or are they? The debate doesn't end here. The debate doesn't end simply because there will always be an argument over cultural rights because the minute you hand over cultural rights, there is a suspicion that you are handing over power, that the other class of people have acquired power. So the upper class has said, if you stop the hunt, that means we as an upper class have lost our status symbols, our cultural apparatus. We have lost our identity. You cannot take it away from us, is what they were saying. This is what we call normalization in cultural studies. Normalization is the conversion of cultural practices, cultural texts, cultural behavior and attitudes as though they have always been available, as though they have always been like this. So we can always say, if you are a royal family in England, we have always hunted. Why are you objecting now? The minute you say we have always hunted, it's almost as though that's a natural right. This normalization and naturalization of cultural practices becomes a kind of coating on power structures. And you will say, they have hunted for 2000 years. It's natural for them to hunt. Why are the animals like this? Because they have to be hunted. Uh, who determined this? How was it established? That is our interest from culture studies perspectives. That is, we are interested in how so-called conventions, concepts, notions, stereotypes have evolved primarily as a mechanism of social differentiation, as a mechanism of diffusing tense situations, but above all else, maintaining status quo in terms of power relations. You do not allow power to slip away from you. Now, if you think in terms of the debates in contemporary um, India or any part of the world, quarrels over syllabus, over symbols like statues, flags, national emblems, are not about those things. It's about the meanings we attach to those things, which brings me to the next point. You see, for cultural studies, um, the case histories that we look at in terms of, say, uh, advertisements or, or films, the cultural artifact, which is the film or the emblem, is only a small unit of an entire process. A process where, like I said, we see ideology, we see power relations, we see social differentiation. In other words, it's important to recognize the symbol as possessing a lot of meaning and meaning is about power. Now, what do we mean? What do we understand by the term meaning of a symbol? Meaning of a symbol could be actually several things. It could imply financial value as in the meaning of a piece of diamond is this much. Now, if you have been following the debates for the last few months about the Kohinoor, the government of India wants the Kohinoor brought back. Tell me, why do we need the Kohinoor? Is there any reason? It's a piece of stone. Technically, it's a piece of stone. All right. Then the government said, but it's part of our history. Then somebody else said, we are emotionally attached to the Kohinoor. Now, none of us has actually seen this diamond, right? We are emotionally attached. Let's take these two examples. One, it's part of our history. Two, we are emotionally attached to it. How you can be emotionally attached to something you have never seen, we don't know. Never mind. The point I'm trying to make is, when the government says, when India says it's part of our history, this history is what I'm calling meaning. Meaning is the kind of national political value we have placed on a stone. And we are saying that's ours, give it back to us. You cannot keep it in England. What, what exactly are we saying? What we are saying is our national identity is attached to that diamond. That's meaning. And when the British took it away, they violated our national identity. Second, emotional attachment. Why are we attached to a stone sitting somewhere in England? The stone doesn't come from our family. It's not something we have owned. 
it's not something we possess it's not even something we have seen then why are we so exercised about a stone now you see emotional attachment is also meaning why because it makes sense to us in certain ways it may not make sense politically it may not make sense if you say ah diamond is just carbon so you cannot go and tell people i don't know why you are fighting about the kohinoor after all it's a piece of carbon people will be offended are you saying the diamond is only carbon in terms of chemistry yes it's only carbon but you see we are not looking at chemistry we are not looking at the composition of the kohinoor what we are talking about is the emotions the carbon piece generates what i am calling meaning so this argument over cultural property the investment in kohinoor the battle over kohinoor and you'll remember some years ago when vijay malya bought the sword of tipu sultan he was a national hero now he's not now he's no longer a national hero but why was he a national hero then he brought back something that belongs to us we said now cultural property is not something we directly understand as property because we don't own it as in it I mean i have not bought it you have not bought it but we think india the country our society our cultural history all revolve around that stone diamond stone same now for cultural studies this is a particularly interesting case because property implies ownership property implies value which could be financial which could be of various kinds i am suggesting we have got two values around the stone one the value as historical artifact the other as emotional attachment this means effectively for us our cultural property must be returned to us this determines the power relations between india and england let me move on further to the practices through which normalization has been effected for those of us who have understood something of the mechanics of this i gave you the example of the textbook of of studying shakespeare um when we think in terms of violence or war or environmental degradation we normally think of these as unconnected to cultural practices i am going to suggest to you that these acts of violence these privileged actions like sport or whatever are signs of power now what do i mean by signs sign is an emblem it's a mark it's a trace but the sign contains value systems ideologies hegemonies woven into it condensed and compressed into it we at first sight don't see this in operation because we see cultural practices as neutral like i said we say oh it's just an advertisement that's just a film which is clearly inadequate what do we mean by this you see power when it operates visibly is far less dangerous than when it operates invisibly because persuasion rhetoric stereotyping capture the psyche of an individual of a community and sometimes of a whole culture of a whole age charles taylor would speak about contemporary social imaginaries now the contemporary social imaginary whether it's about the nation or about sport or about environmentalism whatever it might be can only be brought home to us not through abstract concepts but through cultural practices what i'm calling science okay now the decision making process or what is increasingly called cultural policy studies are determined by the state by commercial operators by advertising agencies by cultural intermediaries they persuade us that this is right that's wrong this is valuable that is not have you considered for a minute how fashions change clothing uh social media fashions uh taste in music how do they change you will say oh but that changes because the audience has begun to prefer something else yeah but how does the audience know which one to follow how does the audience get persuaded that this is fashionable that is not this is old this is new 
How does the audience know? Look, the audience does not understand fashion. The audience is not trained to examine fashion. It doesn't understand the product, where it comes from, but it understands one thing very clearly. This has social value, this does not. This will attract attention for the right reasons, this will attract attention for the wrong reasons. How does the audience know? The cultural intermediaries like advertisements, like modeling, like the fashion shows, tell us this is trending. The term trending is not only about what is acceptable, but what is desirable. As in, the cultural practice of modeling of fashion dressing is not about the clothes as valuable. It's about clothes that are desirable. Who desires? We do. Oh, that looks interesting. I should buy it. Moving away from this to demonstrate power in another field, let's take a look at an entirely different kind of product which we are persuaded about. Think of advertisements for motorcycles. What are the two things that we look for in a vehicle? You will say um, it should be fast and comfortable and it should be adequate in terms of mileage. Fair enough. As in these are common, uh, we all accept it. Now think in terms of the advertisements being promoting that promote certain kinds of motorbikes. First, they will emphasize power. Now there is a problem here because India doesn't have road conditions that enable high speed biking. But they will still emphasize power. Why? Because powered, high power vehicles are desirable. Second, who desires this kind of power? 65 year old people? Nuns? Politicians? No, younger men. It's a gendered masculine bike which is being projected. Not family vehicles to carry your grandma and your mother-in-law. That's not the purpose of a bike. Do you know of anybody who bought a bike to carry his mother-in-law to the city? No. You will carry your girlfriend to the city, not your mother-in-law. So you cannot have a bike which is meant to be a family vehicle. That's not the point. Third, mileage. Why mileage? Well, you see, you may have some problems with money. You may not have that kind of money to fuel this up. And this is a bike that obviously if it's very powerful, will consume more petrol. So you need mileage. Now think of what is being suggested to you. You get a powerful, stylish machine which also enables you to save money in terms of fuel, your fuel bills and things like this. You see, the persuading power of this advertisement, the persuasive power of this advertisement is because these are projected as the desirable qualities that you desire in the bike. Whether they are True, authentic and necessary, we will not ask. You see, what is being given to us is a set of qualities we aspire to, not necessarily qualities we need. All right. Suppose they were to say, OK, here is a bike that helps you control your diabetes. Do you think it will work? It won't work. Why will it not work? Because that's not the purpose of the bike. That's not what I am looking for in a bike. That's not what the college kid is looking for in a bike. You see, the qualities we aspire to are not necessarily innate to us. It's cultural practices, science and cultural texts that persuade us these are the qualities you ought to want. These are the qualities you ought to desire. And once you desire these qualities, we give you the product. Now think of what's happening here. Where is the power in all this? The power lies at two levels. One is the power of the advertisement, the language, the rhetoric of the advertisement. The second is the power of the product. This is good, should buy. But you cannot say, uh, by the way, we are trying to sell this to you because we make a profit. Does any company you know which manufactures motorcycles tell you how much money they make because you are buying a product? They won't. Why? Because that cannot be revealed. What they will tell you is, it is good for you. It targets you. It's beneficial to you. Not about us. But that's the hidden persuasion of popular cultural artifacts. What I'm getting you to see here is that the 
angle pursued in these advertisements, in these cultural practices, centers the consumer, but it encodes a specific kind of power relations between the manufacturer and the consumer, between the advertiser, advertising agency and the consumer, but that is not something we recognize. So why should we read this? Why should we examine these? We should examine these because as students of cultural studies, we should be aware that popular culture is not innocent. It is not about just entertainment. It is not about just having fun. It is about the way social differentiation works, the way social differentiation operates for people to be persuaded for people to sell, for people to buy. Cultural practices are not innocent. Cultural practices are not naive. Because they encode power relations, it is important for cultural studies people to document these ones. So as we have seen, the advertisement that tries to sell you the motorcycle is actually persuading you that certain qualities are desirable. Now, the whole purpose of a consumer-driven society is to replace utility with say style. They cannot replace this easily, which is why you require cultural practices, which is exactly what cultural studies actually examines. Now you will then ask, what is the consequence of this kind of relationship between power and culture? Now if you recall what I have already said about uh, hunting and, and the clash between say Shakespeare and Shakespeare's plays and Fifty Shades of Grey, in the process of evaluating cultural practices as good and bad or valuable and not valuable, some cultures are erased. That is, certain practices are rejected as worthless. And you will recall my instance from African American slavery in the United States. So you will say, oh, African culture is not worth preserving or worth studying or worth taking into the classroom because after all, it is primitive, barbaric and non-modern. The minute you make a claim like this, you have converted the system of power relations in society into a cultural power relations. That is, it converts power relations existing between classes and between races into a system by which cultural practices can be devalued. This means effectively that culture as we understand it with a capital C, becomes a culture only of the privileged classes. The others are all rejected as worthless. So we will read Shakespeare, but we will not read Fifty Shades of Grey. We will read high-flying science fiction, but we won't read cheap, trashy pulp magazines. This effectively means culture is hierarchized, is organized into various layers, valued, less valued, not valued at all. This we refer to as the process of exclusion. Exclusion is the granting of privilege to certain cultural practices and rejecting it from others, to include certain things as acceptable and rejecting others as not acceptable. And these are usually disguised as advantages to the nation, advantages to the race, advantages to the people. Do you think this is a futile exercise to examine? No, it's not because we should understand that when we examine cultural practices, we are actually looking at a larger frame and that larger frame is social differentiation, questions of economic power, questions of political engagement and political power. When you think in terms of counter movements, we are thinking of cultural practices that encode resistance as well. That is, resistance is important to cultural studies because these acts of resistance, such as ethical shopping, um, there are campaigns all over the world of buy local, as in to buy only local products. What does this mean? It means you should only buy those products that are manufactured, grown in your own county or your own village or your own town and not buy products from larger multinational corporations and supermarkets. Be local, buy local, as in support your local farm, farmer's uh, products or whatever, your local dairy, your local vegetable vendor and your local store, instead of shopping only at Walmart and the, and the big MNC stores. This kind of action towards 
consumerism is cultural resistance. But what is important in all of this, please understand, is these acts of cultural resistance are in fact modulating into acts of economic resistance because they are saying our markets are not for you. Our consumers are not for you. Our products are top priority. Our consumers will buy our products only. This is about therefore economic benefits. It's about the definitions of the nation. To go back to the example I gave you before, why is Kohinoor important? Because if you have fought, disagreed and claimed victory in an anti-colonial struggle with Britain, then India has the right to assert itself as a sovereign power. If India asserts itself as a sovereign power, then India is also entitled to its cultural rights among the League of Nations. In the global world, India can say these are our cultural properties, these are our heritage items and artifacts and we claim them in the name of our people. That is, it is our privilege and our responsibility to ensure that this becomes part of our legacy. Now notice here, we are moving away from cultural practice to questions of national importance, of international negotiations. Let me quickly now summarize what we have understood here. What is important here is, you always need to see cultural practices as privileging certain forms, but underneath this is not cultural forms, but the relations in society or what I've referred to as social differentiation. Cultural practices enable certain classes to retain their power by rejecting certain others. We are persuaded, forced, perhaps force is not the best word, but I'll use it all the same because it implies power to buy certain things, buy certain products or indulge in certain practices because they are seen as beneficial, useful or aspirational, like I said. This model of exclusion and inclusion often generates resistance. It creates subcultural forms, alternate ethical practices, alternate cultural traditions, because you do not know how to battle power directly. You cannot fight globalization as a process because it's just too large. What you can fight is the cultural emphasis, the cultural products and the cultural practices of globalization with countercultural practices. So it's important to recognize that there is no cultural practice which is innocent, that there is no cultural practice which is devoid of a system of power relations. All cultural practices, all cultural artifacts are exercises in power relations. Thank you.